Hi, today we're talking about biochemistry. Specifically, we're going to be introducing proteins. In proteins, one of the key themes of biology becomes really apparent. That is that structure of a molecule informs its function. Proteins are a great example, and we can see this in action in the world all around us and in our very own bodies. So first of all, what in the world are proteins? Well, you can find proteins in a variety of places, one being um, enzymes. Now here you see an example of this lactase enzyme, and we know that enzymes end in ASE, and they're very specific. These enzymes speed up chemical reactions. They control chemical reactions so that the world isn't simply falling apart all around us. These enzymes are really specific meaning they act on very specific molecules. For example, the enzyme lactase acts upon the sugar lactose. So if you're lactose intolerant, if you can't break down the sugar found in dairy products, um, cheese, ice cream, milk, then you might need to take a lactase enzyme supplement. But proteins are much more than just enzymes. Proteins are also structural. Well, what do we mean by structural? Well, um, you see here a couple of great examples. One being the silk in spider web, right? The silk that spiders spin is actually ounce for ounce stronger than steel. It's a polymer, it's a protein polymer produced by that spider's um, body and their spinnerets. Your hair is also another great example of a structural protein. Your fingernails as well. Those are all made of the amino acid building blocks coming together, forming their primary, secondary, and tertiary quaternary structures, which we'll talk about in just a minute, to form the structures of life. Uh, feathers are another example. And we also see structural proteins in the actin and myosin, the things that are actually in our muscles, um, allowing the muscle fibers to move and allowing um, for structure of our cells overall. Proteins can also be involved in defense. And here you see here antibodies. Antibodies are produced by your body's white blood cells, by your immune system, and their purpose is to kind of sequester or identify foreign substances. We call them antigens in your body. The antibodies themselves are proteins produced by these cells and are really important to maintaining a healthy immune system. Proteins can also be signal molecules like hormones throughout your body, and they can even act as receptors. Here you see um, an HIV virus up top, and here you see um, one of your body cells. Now HIV, that virus that causes AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, actually infiltrates your body's own cells. Viruses aren't considered alive because they can't reproduce on their own. They have to hijack your cell's machinery. Now, before the HIV can infect your cells, your cells actually have to recognize the HIV molecule. You can see here on the surface, um, these in yellow, these are um, part of the receptors that are on the HIV molecule. When they're recognized by the other set of receptors that are on your cell's um, cell membrane, then the two can actually dock and HIV can enter the, the cell. If you want to check out a really great animation of HIV, its life cycle, and how this actually happens, click on the link below to check out an animation from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So now let's actually talk about what these proteins are made of. We learned a little bit about what they do. Now let's really get down to what is their structure. You've learned that um, Proteins, along with lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, are all what we call polymers. And poly, meaning many, so polymers are made up of many monomers. And each of these different types of polymers that we've talked about, um, whether it's a carb or a lipid, nucleic acids, or proteins, are made up of their own unique kind of monomer. The monomers of a protein are amino acids. And there are about 20 different amino acids that build the plethora of proteins that exist in nature. And what's really important is that it's the sequence of these amino acids dictated by the DNA that controls and builds the different kinds of proteins. So let's take a look at what the structure of an amino acid really looks like. 
an amino acid, and all 20 amino acids have the same basic structure, have a central carbon atom, and they have two important functional groups, the amino functional group, a carboxyl functional group, Coming off that central carbon, we always have a hydrogen. And then we have what makes each of the amino acids different from one another, but what we call this R group, or variable group. Each of the amino acids has the same structure, but has its own unique variable group. And it's this group here that determines if it's hydrophilic, or if the amino acid is hydrophobic. It determines if we have an acidic amino acid or a basic amino acid. Will it be polar or nonpolar? These qualities are all determined by that variable R group. Now, I wouldn't recommend memorizing all of those R groups. They're things that you can look up on your own, but it's important to understand this basic structure. There's a few other key points about this structure that we should take a peek at right now. One of which is the fact that um, we can see here we have some polar bonds right in this core group. We know that this hydrogen-nitrogen bond is polar. We know that this oxygen-carbon bond here is polar. We know that um, here again we have two more polar bonds. And this is going to be incredibly important when we start talking about how these amino acids come together to form a protein, or more appropriately, a polypeptide chain. So let's look at how we build a polypeptide. Now, we're calling it a polypeptide and not a protein at this point for a couple of reasons. First of all, let's break down this word. Poly meaning many, and peptide is the name given to the bond between amino acids. So essentially we are creating a molecule that has many bonds between amino acids, so more than one amino acid strung together. We won't officially call it a protein until we've folded that polypeptide chain and achieved all the levels of protein structure. So let's take a look at how we're going to bond these amino acids together. I'm going to build here two different amino acids. Okay, remember we have our same basic structure, our amino group on the side, our variable R group on the bottom, and our carboxyl group. And right next to it, I'm going to build a second amino acid. Now the procedure is the same for um, any of our amino acids, so it doesn't matter at this point what our R group is. All right, so now we have our two amino acids next to each other. If you recall, we're always joining these monomers together through the process of dehydration synthesis. Let's remember what that means, dehydration. Okay, if you dehydrate something, what are we taking out of it? That's right, we're taking out water. And the word synthesis, synth meaning to build. So in dehydration synthesis, we're building a molecule by removing water. Recall that it's the functional groups of a molecule that actually interact with each other. Now, a peptide bond is formed between two amino acids by taking the hydroxyl off of one amino acid, and the hydrogen off the amino of a second amino acid. And if we do that, that's what we get. HOH or water. Now because we formed those bonds, we have a couple unhappy atoms. This carbon here only has one, two, three bonds. Recall that carbon needs four to be stable. Nitrogen here only has one, two bonds. Recall that in most instances, nitrogen needs three to be stable. So a peptide bond is going to form for us between the carbon here and the nitrogen here. 
This is the peptide bond. I'll draw it in full so you can take a peek one more time. Here's what we have left from one amino acid. Here's what we have left on the second amino acid. So the peptide bond will form here. This links the two amino acids together. What I've now created is a dipeptide. Di meaning two, linking two amino acids together. If I were to add a third, now I would have a polypeptide. Go ahead and practice this. Again, one thing I'd like to draw our attention to is the fact that we do have some polar bonds here between the hydrogen and nitrogen, and here between the oxygen and carbon. Okay? These are going to be really important for our protein structure. So in proteins, structure is critical to its function. And proteins can have up to four different levels of structure, and we're going to talk about each of those. But first of all, let's talk about a little bit about where this protein comes from. If we consider that all the information in a eukaryotic cell is stored in the nucleus of the cell. And in that nucleus, I have my DNA molecule, my double helix. The DNA cannot leave the nucleus, so it needs to be converted to single-stranded mRNA. That mRNA can then leave the nucleus and go to um, what we call ribosomes, which are our actual protein factory. As that single-stranded mRNA is fed through our protein factory, we then create our polypeptide strand. This is actually the first level, or what we call primary structure of a protein. It's determined by the sequence of amino acids, which is in turn determined by the sequence of nucleotides in the DNA. There's our primary structure. It's how the 20 different amino acids are linked together with our peptide bonds. We're not at a full-blown protein yet, though. The next thing that happens is that primary structure of sequence of amino acids is going to get folded, and it can get folded in two ways. We either make what we call these alpha helices, which are spirals here, or beta pleated sheets. And if you take a close look at this picture, you can see our good friend the hydrogen bonds that we found in water molecules, between water molecules, giving rise to those properties like cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension, heat capacity, and all those others. Remember that hydrogen bonds in general are on the weak side and can be disrupted by changes in temperature, among other um, forces. But the hydrogen bonds that are in the backbone of these amino acids, remember we talked about the fact that carbon and oxygen forms a polar bond, that the nitrogen and hydrogen forms a polar bond. Because we have these polar, um, polar bonds here, the oxygen is a little bit negative, the hydrogen end is a little bit positive, and we can form hydrogen bonds between the backbone of the amino acids in that primary structure. This creates our alpha helices and our beta pleated sheets. The next level of protein structure is going to be dependent on our R groups. The R groups, some being polar, some being nonpolar, um, are then going to fold in on themselves in what we call tertiary structure. Or the third level of protein structure. This is really due to interactions between the R groups. And you can imagine this is really dependent on that initial primary structure.
Now we can have a whole host of interactions here. We can have ionic interactions. We could have hydrogen bonds. We can have um, covalent bonds forming, covalent partnerships, um, and a whole variety of others that are going to take this initial polypeptide that's been folded into our helices, folded into our beta pleated sheets, and now it's going to put the whole molecule together. The fourth level of protein structure that not all proteins exhibit is then what we call quaternary structure. or fourth level. And in the fourth level structure, we're going to take several polypeptide strands that have their primary, secondary, and tertiary structure and put them all together. Here's a great example. So I have here um, some very high-tech equipment, pipe cleaners. Let's model protein structure together. And I suggest you practice this. So primary protein structure is just the sequence of amino acids represented here by my straight pipe cleaner. You can imagine that each little section of this is an amino acid strung together by those covalent bonds, those peptide bonds. Here's our primary structure, determined by our DNA, determined by our nucleotide sequence. Secondary structure is then due to the hydrogen bonds between the backbone, and we form alpha helices, there's an alpha helis, and beta pleated sheets. So here is secondary structure. Here is secondary structure. Tertiary structure is due to the interactions between the R groups of the amino acids, and it folds that polypeptide into a 3D shape. Okay? It's the combination of all the helices and all the pleated sheets together. I'm going to do the same thing one more time. Primary structure. Secondary structure, tertiary structure, how it's all associated together. Then to make it quaternary or fourth level structure, it's how these multiple polypeptide strands interact with one another. So here would be my quaternary structure polypeptide. At this point, we can call it a protein. It's folded into its unique three-dimensional shape, and this shape which is dictated by the sequence of nucleotides, take it all the way back, okay, determines the function of this protein. So if I change the structure, it follows that I change the function. Let's take a look at how that happens. How do we destroy a protein? Remember here that we have a couple of different kinds of bonds at play. We have these strong covalent peptide bonds between our amino acids. And then we have these weaker hydrogen bonds that are forming our alpha helices and our beta pleated sheets. Beyond that, in tertiary structure, we have these ionic interactions, more hydrogen bonds, and even some covalent interactions. Let's just take the example of heat. And let's add some heat to the system and consider what happens. Recall that heat, that temperature, is the molecular motion of molecules. So as I raise the temperature of this protein, it starts to move faster. Now, my covalent bonds are strong. They're in no danger. But think about water. Water evaporates because eventually the molecules are moving fast enough that those hydrogen bonds break. And if those hydrogen, I built my protein too well, and if my hydrogen bonds break because my molecule is moving fast enough, my protein loses its shape, it loses its structure. It's what we call denatured. It's lost its nature. When a protein becomes denatured by an increase in temperature, by changing the pH of the solution that it's in, by changing the salinity of the solution it's in, the protein loses its structure and therefore it loses its function. Structure and function go hand in hand when we're talking about proteins. In fact, we can see this in many different places. For example, in sickle cell anemia, it's a single nucleotide change in the DNA, which causes a single um, amino acid substitution in the primary structure. That one change impacts the tertiary structure of the hemoglobin molecule and results in sickle cell anemia. 
structure and function are critically important. If you want to explore this idea more fully, I highly recommend the activity on the Concord Consortium's website. Um, click on the link below this protein folding activity. It's a great one to go and check out. Hope you enjoyed and um, keep exploring.